morning. It is a good morning. It's so good to be with you guys um, on Baptism Sunday. Um, my name is Adam, and I am, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the pastors here, and it is uh, a great joy of mine to get to come and preach the scriptures to you each, uh, each and every Sunday. Um, we are in the book of Mark, uh, which if you've been to Aletheia any time in the last like three months, should be unsurprising to you. Uh, but if you, if you have a Bible, you may open it to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. Uh, and uh, as, you're, as you're turning there, I just want to uh, underscore that this is a slight change in the announcement about the uh, pre-Thanksgiving potluck. If any of you grew up around church, you know that like potluck is not a sacrament, but it's close, right? I mean, the Lord gave us baptism in the Lord's Supper, but the South gave us the potluck. So, <laughs> yes, come on, there you go. So, um, so if you're going to be joining us, listen, we don't want you to just bring traditional Thanksgiving fare. We want you to bring a, a dish like from you, like from your, your home that you would like to come and share with us. Our church is super diverse, and we want to bring that to bear in that moment, um, partially because we just think it'll be really fun. The other part is I'm a foodie, and I want to eat all of the food, so bring it, um, especially when it comes to the pie eating contest. As a proud father, my, my uh, daughters hold second place in that one. Who won first place last year? Yeah, 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 and um, she's, wow, so I'm not saying the gauntlet's been thrown down, but a high five's been thrown up, so... If you, got, if you have a pie game that you're like, you're going down, girl, bring it. Bring it. We want to taste that, too. So uh, we're going to have a lot of fun there. Um, okay, to the Bible. Great segue. Thanks, Pastor Donnie. <laughs> Join me in Mark 10, 17. We have a long passage of Scripture to read. A very important point to make. As he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments? Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And his disciples were amazed at his words. But again, Jesus said to them, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished. And he said to them, or, and they said to him, Well, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible. Not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. <laughs> glad, glad you picked that up. <laughs> and Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time both houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them and they were amazed and those who followed were afraid and Taking the tw twelve again, he began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. 
And he said to him, well, what do you want me to do for you? And they said, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left hand, in glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink you will drink and the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called to them all, and he said to him, to them, You know that the Gentiles who are considered rulers lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them? Well, it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must first be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Spirit, help us. Lord, some of us have lots of and lots of status and power. Others of us don't. Some of us really want it, and others of us want those who have it to lose it. We confess, Lord, that on the eve of an election, it's easy for us to think about power in a very worldly way. Forgive us. Help us to see what kingdom status, kingdom authority, and kingdom power are all about. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you imagine being the rich young ruler? You're rich, you're young, and you're a ruler. Like, you nailed it. Good job. You know, you got the trifecta. I mean, you just won bingo life. Right? I mean, you won. You got them all. You're rich, you're young, and you're ruler. That, that moniker, that description, doesn't it so well summarize the reason that most people come to the city? Come to Boston. Come to school. Come to your job. So you can be rich. I know some of you are saying, well, I mean, I just, I just want to have enough. Yeah, yeah, I know, but enough is a big bucket for you. <laughs> You're like, enough to buy a few homes and a couple of cars and retire when I'm 40. Enough. And young, whoa, and a ruler. Man, you've got money, you've got power, and you did it all. You're like on that, you know, 30 under 30 list that Forbes puts out every year. You're like, you nailed it. You're just destroying it at life. Like, you're good. <laughs> and so this guy comes up to Jesus. Good Jewish kid. Walks up to the Lord, kneels before him. Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he's got manners. He's got class. And I think he had a pinky ring on when he lifted his hands like this. And Jesus said, well, you know the commandments. Honor your father and mother. Jesus kind of names off like seven of the ten. And the young man said, man, Jesus, I've been doing those my whole life. Wow. (laughs) Wow. Let's just pause. Normally I'm picking on Peter because he's the one who says stupid things, but whoa. (laughs) You just said to the Lord that you're nailing the commandments. If any of you feel that way this morning, I hope by the end of our time together, you don't. So he comes to the Lord and he says, yeah, all these things I've been doing since I was young. And Jesus says, well, one thing you lack. Sell everything you've got. Give it to the poor. Come follow me. Some of you in this room are like, yeah. You get them, Pastor. You get those rich people with their power, Right, and their privilege and their money. Like, yeah, get them, Jesus. Like, I knew how Jesus would vote. I knew it. I knew it. (laughs) 
Yeah, yeah. Wink and a nod. I see you. (laughs) And so the way we expect, many of you, the rest of this story to go isn't how it goes. There's a middle section we'll come back to. But after that discussion, very enterprising sons of Zebedee, James and John, they're like, oh, Jesus is not about the rich or the young or the powerful. He's about people like us. James and John, sons of fishermen, young, poor, no power, in a moment of political expediency, come up to the guy that they're pretty sure is about to win the next election and kick out the Romans and go full David 2.0, raise the armies, maybe even make it all the way to Rome. Who knows? Who knows? They're like, hey, Jesus, come here. We want you to promise to do whatever we ask. <laughs> like, you're a real rookie at this, but okay. <laughs> and Jesus, will you pinky swear that everything I'm about to say is okay? So Jesus is like, uh-huh, what do you, what do you want? And they said, we want to sit at your right hand and your left hand. Now, what do you expect Jesus to say? Because most of you just read this last story like a solid Democrat. Is oh, well, you lack money and you lack power, so let me give some to you. And he nopes them too. <laughs> he says, nope. Now, some of you in this room are like, yeah, you tell those lefties. I knew how Jesus would vote. Yeah, get him. Got to earn it around here. Okay. Settle down. (laughs) He says, you don't even know what you're asking for. You don't even know what you're asking for. And of course, when the other ten hear that they thought of this idea before the other ten did, they're like, hey, I wanted to be Secretary of State or Secretary of the Treasury, that's what they were vying for. When, when it, if you sat at the right hand or the left hand of, of an ancient king, what you, that means you were in his court. You were like top dog, right? I mean, you weren't the top dog, but you were in the pack. And that's what, they were, that's what they were jostling for. And Jesus was like, look, you don't even understand what you're asking. Because the kind of status that you want is not what my kingdom is about. I'm here to give you a different and better kind of status that neither one of these polars, polar opposites promising you, I'm here to give you kingdom status. And kingdom status, my friends, is given to you so that the world can see Jesus Christ in you. Kingdom status is given to you so that the world, the world, the watching world can see Jesus Christ in you. And here on, we've just got to, we've got to see our own confirmation bias. Can, can we just be honest with ourselves for just a moment? Like You have and I have, we all have something inside of us that feels like one of these political polls, though, is like, I mean, Jesus isn't, a, but, but we all know. He, I mean, he's not a registered, but I mean, he would if he were here. I mean, even Richard Dawkins thinks if Jesus was alive today, he'd be an atheist. I'm glad you see the humor in that. (laughs) We all want to make Jesus look like us. We all want to worship Jesus after our own image. And we all want that pretend Jesus to grant us what we want. And what we end up worshiping isn't the Jesus Christ of the Scriptures. We end up worshiping a drawn-in Jesus on a mirror who seems to look an awful lot like me and vote like me and think like me and spin like me. Hmm, like the same music I like? How about that? Jesus is not here to grant us either one of these false utopias. He's here to bring his kingdom and to grant to those of us who would receive it kingdom status. And for those of us who have received salvation, have received the mercy of God, have received forgiveness of sins and the washing and the cleansing of the blood of Jesus, That is a kingdom status that's given to you so that others may see Christ in you. That's a status that's given to you so that others may see Christ in you. So let's just walk through this text for just a minute because I can see that I just bummed some of you out. 
when I informed you that, like, oh, Jesus isn't actually a closet Democrat or Republican, or even an out-of-the-closet Democrat or Republican. And this is critically important because it seems like every, I've been at this game long enough now, pastoring this church, like every two years, we get pulled like this, and then I'll have to preach a different kind of sermon next Sunday, depending on how Tuesday goes. And so maybe I could just go ahead and tell you that Jesus Christ is about his kingdom and is about granting you privilege to be in his kingdom, status to be in his kingdom, the opportunity to be in his kingdom, not for you to bastardize his kingdom and make it part of yours. For me to do it. And when we do that, we don't make Jesus look beautiful. When we do that, the world doesn't see Jesus in us. Oh, pastor, you're just too even-handed. Gosh, I get that email every two weeks, so would you stop sending it, please? Because we all really know the problem is, you know, and then you proceed to tell me in 17,000 words. Fun fact, if you want me to read your email, bullet points, that's the fastest way. (laughs) Kingdom status is given to us so that the world may see Jesus in us. Jesus is about his kingdom more than he's about mine or yours. So what does this mean? Well, here comes this rich young ruler. Man, if you were going to put anybody on your campaign finance committee, it was the rich guy and the young guy and the powerful guy, right? And so he's thinking like, you know, he's going to be treated by Jesus like everybody else treats him. And he gets noped, and that must have been very disturbing, unsettling. And he says, look, in order for you to receive status from me, here's all I need you to do. Your hands right now are full of your own stuff. And I have better stuff to give you. All I need you to do is empty your hands of your gold and your stuff and your power and your privilege and all that status and then receive from me treasure in heaven. Now, that's a great deal. That's a great deal. That's like walking up to a BMW dealership and they're saying, all right, all we need you to do is give me the cash in your wallet right now so that the key will fit. And I would be like, I have four dollars. And they'll be like, perfect. I'm like, sweet. <laughs> that's, that's the level of the deal. It's a good deal. Cosmic economy, good deal. But the rich young ruler's like, no, won't do it. And he goes away sad. And then James and John, they're over here and they're saying, well, Jesus, we have nothing. We have nothing. We're, we're asking you. We want what that guy has, but we want it to come from you. So, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, just remember, brother, you know, here, it's 20 bucks. Just don't forget who gave it to you. You know what I mean? We do the same thing. It's called the prosperity gospel. We tip God. We give him a little bit of faith, a little bit of attention, a little bit of, yes, Lord, ooh, I just love you. Mm, Jesus. Mm. You know who you are. <laughs> Expecting him to be like, oh, yeah, oh, well, he had a, like a shake in the service, so give him a new job. Nicer neighborhood. Bigger paycheck. Jesus is here to give us something so much better if we would just take our eyes off what our hands are full of. If we would take our hearts away from going after the things of this world or going after the people who have the things of this world. If we would seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. Hmm. Maybe we read that somewhere. Kingdom status is given to us so that the world can see Jesus in us. This is the kind of church that he's calling us to be and the kind of people that he is rescuing. And so here's what I mean. Kingdom status. Kingdom status is not power in this world. Sometimes it includes power in this world, and sometimes it includes none of the power in this world, but apparently having power or not having power in this world has very little to do with having status before the king of kings because my Jesus was poor. But then in the book of Acts, he includes all sorts of people, rich people, poor people, kind of in the middle people, slaves, king, like there are all kinds of people. They get drawn into this kingdom thing, and nobody has to pay a cover charge. Nobody. But when the disciples are like, well, Jesus, now that guy, he's handsome, young, powerful, he's doing all the stuff, like religiously, and you said it's impossible for him? If it's impossible for him, well, then who can be saved? And when Jesus, his response is, nobody. <laughs> What the heck are we doing, man? 
Like, nobody? Nobody. With man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. And then he does this metaphor. It's like, it's like a camel going through the eye of a needle. Now, how many of you have heard that youth group sermon where somebody told you there was this gate in Jerusalem called the eye of the needle, but to go through it, the camel would have to like get down on all fours? Yeah. Spoiler alert. That's not true. It, it, that's, I, don't, I have no idea where that started. No idea. But as a guy who professionally chases up footnotes, that's not a thing. Jesus was saying, no, it's literally impossible. He's like, imagine trying to shove a camel into a needle. <laughs> it's not happening. Which is why he then comes back to say, but with God all things are possible. And then over here, we've got these guys who've, who've given up everything. I mean, Peter very helpfully points out like, ah, Jesus, I see that you have pointed out that this man needs to give up everything, and I would like to let the record state that I have given up everything. <laughs> like, everything but your pride, Peter. But he <laughs> got that still. Jesus, I don't know if Mark just leaves it out or if Jesus just looks at him and goes like, at the end of this gospel, you're getting yours. But <laughs> it's not what I'm talking about right now. And he, and he goes on to say, listen, these guys, well, Jesus, we don't have anything, and we give up everything, and so we're coming after you to get power in this world. Do you see what they were after? Oh, if I just follow Jesus, if I just come to church, if I just get baptized, if I just sing, if I just pray, then he'll let me sit at his right hand and his left hand. And Jesus is like, you don't even know what you're talking about, man. This is not even a thing. It's not on the menu. It's not being offered here. Kingdom status is something different. So how do we get kingdom status? It's in the middle of these two stories. Between verse 28 and verse 36, I think, 35. She says, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. And they're like, yeah. And he's like, actually impossible. Camel, needle. And they're like, well, I got to go home then. He says, with God, all things are possible. And then he again, again, for the third and final time in Mark's gospel, he says, listen, guys, do you see where we're walking? Uh, up to Jerusalem. Yeah, exactly. We're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed, will be mocked, will be beaten, will be spat upon, will be crucified, and will die, but he will rise. And they're like, okay, <laughs> we don't just, you know, just, we don't even get what he's talking about, but we do. See, kingdom status is given to us, not because we're rich, young, powerful, and we got it all together, N neither because we're none of those things, but we've asked really nicely. Kingdom status is given to us so that others can see Jesus in us, but it's given to us because the one with all the kingdom status, the king who has all the privilege and all the power and all the wealth, I mean, the, the man who walked out of heaven where the streets are made with gold, comes and lets all of it go, all of it go, so that his enemies could be granted status. Jesus let go of his kingdom status so that we and I, you and I might gain it. Jesus let go of his privilege and power and beauty and wonder and all of that good stuff for a brief moment so that we who deserve none of it, none of it, could gain it. Oh, we judge the rich young ruler. Man, if I were there, I'd have given it all up. Yeah, that's because you're 24 and you don't have anything. Right? Get 10 years under your belt thinking hard with your financial planner about how to send your kids to college. You'll be like, well, I mean, I'll give some of it, but somebody's got to send these kids to school. Right? I just got the bill for my kids' braces, and I was like, Jesus is Lord. <laughs> yeah, Pastor Johnny's amening on the front row. Don't, don't faint, brother. It's okay. I didn't mean to trigger you. Yeah. We judge, we judge the rich and ruler. Oh, I would have made the thing. The, the point of these stories, we always read ourselves as the hero. Well, I would have been right there with Jesus, like, oh, that poor guy. No, the point isn't that you're supposed to see yourself as the Jesus in the story because you're not him. You're supposed to go, I'm just like that. I Man, there are parts of my heart, I'm just like this guy. Jesus, look at all these cool things I've done for you. And then there's other parts of my heart where I'm just like these guys. Hey, um, <clears throat> Jesus, how about a little... Kingdom status is something that's different and better than both of those things, and it's given to us not on the basis of our ability to earn it or deserve it or pray it or faith it, but simply to receive it. And the way we receive kingdom status is by willingly letting go. The Bible calls it repentance. 
by laying down our, well, I'm good enough because I have money, or I'm good enough because I have privilege, or I'm good enough because I have power, or I'm good enough because I don't have any of those things. I'm good enough because I'm young, or I'm good enough because I'm old, I'm good enough because I'm a, you know, I've been at this Jesus thing for a long time. I'm good. Here's the, all the reasons I deserve to have Jesus' kingdom given to me. And when you find that in your heart, you let go of it, and you realize, I deserve everything Jesus received, which is wrath, condemnation, separation, judgment, and death. But he, the king, with all of that status, received the judgment in himself, so that we who have none of the kingdom status and can't may be granted it freely. Granted it freely. You know what happens then? Then we have an opportunity to be an, a, a visage of the kingdom of God. People, who are Christians, some of you in here, you're, this is how you roll. Oh, I'm so glad I'm better than all of those people. Proud Christian is an oxymoron. It, it's a sentence that it's like round triangle. I mean, you can say it, but it doesn't mean there's such a thing. Can you imagine what it would be like, friends, if we really got this? Like if we realized that our status before the Lord, our blessing, every good and perfect gift that has come down from the Father of heavenly lights is a grace, is a gift, and is to be received, therefore, with humility, gratitude, and held with open hands. Can you, those kind of people change the world. Those kinds of people ran into the Roman Empire when it was filled with the plague, when everyone else was running out. Those kinds of people run into danger when everyone else is leaving. Those kinds of people lay down their lives. Those kinds of people bring the kingdom of God on the earth. Kingdom status is given to us so that others may see Jesus in us. And I mean, so, so as we're celebrating baptism today, Jesus invokes the very idea. He, he looks at them and says, guys, you can't drink the cup I'm drinking. You can't receive the baptism that I'm undergoing. What, what does that mean? That's a pickup from the book of Psalms, that he's drinking the cup of God's fierce anger at all of the injustice and brokenness in our world. God's righteous determination to put an end to all of that, put an end to Jesus. So that Jesus' mercy could bring new life and new beginning to us. In order to receive kingdom status, we simply have to repent, let go, and open our hands and say, I want to receive this from you, Jesus. I want to receive your acceptance. I want to receive your adoption, your payment for my sins, your righteousness, your blessing, so that I can be someone through whom others see you. So for those of you in here who are followers of Jesus, my simple question is, and what do you need to let go of what are you holding on to so tight? What are your hands so full of that Jesus, even if he wanted to give you something, you just can't hold anything else? And for those of you who aren't yet followers of Jesus, man, can I invite you to receive the kingdom status, to let go of the stress and the anxiety of becoming something so that you can feel like you're something and receive the gift of God's mercy that says, no matter who you are, for what you've done, you now have been granted status in my kingdom as a son, as a daughter, as royalty 